Um, so it's my pleasure to, to host this, this panel, and I just want to maybe share with you some of the research that we do in my lab at Carnegie Mellon uh, in Pittsburgh. And so really, what we're interested in doing uh, in my group is using materials and nanotechnology in bridging the abiotic biotic interface. And that was actually was enumerated in the, in the previous talk. And so really, the question we have is how can we integrate things like natural tissues with synthetic devices. And how do we do this in a way that's not only sort of technologically interesting, but also maybe uh, medically relevant and medically important, and addressing real issues in, in, uh, in things like delivering healthcare at, at reasonable cost. And so uh, what we basically do in my group is, is engineer new kinds of materials and interfaces to accomplish this. And these can be things as simple as a percutaneous catheter that goes into your skin that's infection resistant, all the way to extremely complex devices that are designed to integrate uh, mind and machine through things like brain-machine interfaces to control robotics. And so uh, one recent effort that I'll highlight in my group is the idea of using uh, edible electronics as a way to um, uh, for, for diagnostic and, and therapeutic applications as well. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Marie to talk about, uh, to share her, her topic. Thank you. Um, the concrete technologies that Roman engineers developed 2,000 years ago can provide a transformative prototype for extremely long-lived concretes that are environmentally sustainable and produced with volcanic ash, lime, and seawater. Um, our samples come from the Romacons project, which drilled Roman harbors throughout the Mediterranean. Um, we've measured the material and elastic properties of the concrete's cementitious binder and aluminous tobermoric crystals at the nanoscale. And these studies show that the fabric of these ancient concretes is very different from modern Portland cement concretes. Um, a Roman, an uh, ancient Roman concrete prototype would um, do some very interesting things for us. It could reduce CO2 emissions by about 50% as compared with Portland cement concretes. It could conserve freshwater resources um, through the use of seawater as a hydrating uh, medium. It could sequester chloride and sulfate in crystalline microstructures and improve durability. And it could greatly extend the service life of concrete structures in marine environments. And potentially, um, it could um, act as a chemical barrier in concrete waste repositories, um, given the cation exchange properties of aluminous tobermorite crystals and philipsite. Um, and in conclusion, I'd like to say that um, innovations using ancient Roman concrete principles and volcanic rock um, can transform some emerging technologies um, of in involving marine concrete, waste repositories, and um, possibly repairs to the global concrete infrastructure. Thanks, Richard. So <clears throat> I'm Rick Kainer, a professor of chemistry and material science and engineering at UCLA. And I work on graphene. Paul gave us a great introduction to graphene. And I'm very interested in its use in supercapacitors. And supercapacitors are charged storage devices. They look like batteries, but they charge and discharge up to 1,000 times faster. The idea is that you have a material with a very high surface area and high conductivity, and all the charge is right on the surface. So you can get it in and, and get it out very quickly. Um, this is now a billion dollar industry. It didn't really exist 20 years ago, but it's growing very rapidly. And if you look at any electronic devices, your cell phone, your computers, you'll find that the bulk of the real estate is taken up by the battery. And it's actually possible to do better. And in the future, we're going to see much more miniaturized devices. And we'll see hybrid systems with, between batteries and supercapacitors. If you look at the screen, you'll see a form of graphene that we make. We start with graphite oxide. It's a chief precursor. We hit it with a laser from a light scribe device. And you can see on the screen that we can print over 100 graphene micro supercapacitors in just a few minutes. Um, once we do that, we can make supercapacitors out of them. And you'll see on the screen that they're, they're much far superior to commercial supercapacitors. And so the question is, 
how soon and can these get into industrial uses and, and how soon can we see the technology? And I'm hoping that's just a, a matter of a few years. Thank you. All right, thanks, Michael. Yes, hello, my name is Michael Oy. I'm representing San Jose State University. And I'm gonna take an um, approach here where I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the research that I do. And I'm also gonna talk about the other aspect of what I do is involving teaching of the nanomaterials. So talking a little bit about the, the research, and you see some of the slides that I have up here, and it was also presented on by, um, by our keynote speaker, Paul. So one of the things I do is I also work on graphene, and we grow it for, um, for various applications such as supercapacitors and, and for DNA sequencing. But I'm also looking at more trying to understand what's going on during the synthesis, and particularly during the plasma synthesis of the graphene. Now, there are certainly applications for it, as, as was mentioned earlier, for things like DNA sequencing and other bi biological applications. Um, the other thing that I'll point out, too, with regards to some of the semiconductor industry has been working on some of the, the plasma synthesis of the graphene, but we're taking a lot of that from the fields that we've, uh, we've had with the, the Silicon Valley and the, um, and, and, the, and the knowledge that we've had with the semiconductor processing techniques. So that's the other component. It's comp other component involving the education. So as, as, I, as I teach fundamentals of nanomaterials in, in classes, you know, what I try to do is I, I, I really do try to teach the class, as the name implies, fundamentals of nanomaterials. So why is that? It's because if you look at from about 10 years ago down here in the Silicon Valley, people were working on the semiconductor industry, but as that started to fizzle away and we were looking at more at the, at the biological applications, well, as long as you had the core, as long as you had the fundamental understanding of what's going on down at the, at the physics levels and not only the, the nano, but the micro scale, as, um, as our keynote speaker pointed out, then you can translate that to other areas of technology. So we're trying to teach the fundamentals, and that's going to be here um, where I say that the students are the key. And in looking at areas of what are the breakthrough technology areas, I just put up a slide here. I, I, took, I took this from Coastal Ventures. They're a VC capitalist uh, firm here in Silicon Valley. And you've got the areas that they're interested in. So when you ask the question of what areas are going to be looking at uh, in the future for breakthroughs in technology, uh, I think looking at this graph here on the left is a, is a good demonstration example of that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Michael. So, and uh, Paul gave us a nice keynote, so thank you very much for that. And so I want to pivot right away to open the discussion on uh, this panel by thinking about manufacturing. Because I think at the end of the day, we all have to manufacture something in a reliable, robust manner. And so I think that one of the key here is the challenges that we have as kind of nanotechnologists is how do we capture and preserve the value that nanotechnology gives us, but uh, being able to make things essentially in a reliable manner. And so, so Richard, I want to sort of open that up, up to you. I want to get maybe your thoughts on on basically how we can build robustness uh, while sort of, again, capturing value of materials and devices and architectures at small scales. What are some things that, that you, you found in, in, your, in your work in this area? So one of the things that's clear, depending on what application you're looking for, you need a different manufacturing process. And so, for example, as you saw with the kind of graphene we're looking for, we need a material with a surface area of above 1,500 meters squared per gram that's highly conductive. Yet, when you put it together, it doesn't collapse down to, to single layers. And so the way we do it, we start with graphite oxide, this inexpensive precursor that comes from graphite. We hit it with a laser. And because of that, we end up with this open architecture. It looks like corrugated cardboard along the edge. And it's a completely scalable process. So we're hoping that this can simply be translated into industrial applications. Got it, got it. Yeah, so that's great on the, on the material side. Maybe on the devices side, maybe Paul can give us some insight into not only taking, going from that kind of core materials, but building them up into useful structures. Are there any kind of um, sort of, what are, maybe some recent advances in that, in that area that, that would be uh, interesting to, to talk about and comment on? Yeah, from a device perspective, I think it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tricky business to, for example, if you're going to make an electronic device because you're competing with, say, the most successful technology in all of human history, silicon. Um, so it's very hard to decide you're going to put Intel out of business. But if you can find <laughs> niche applications where, uh, say, silicon or whatever your competitor is doesn't do well, that's the place to go first. So you get to make simple devices, build your technology, learn how to work with the material when you don't have to jump all the way to uh, something that's extraordinarily sophisticated. So if you can do that, and I think these materials, you've seen many examples of that as we've gone along, if you can do that, you have a much better chance of building up a technology base. Mm -hmm.